by its uh, geographical position, Sweden would see planes from both Germany and the Allies crash or make emergency landings on its territory. And as a declared neutral country, it would or rather should have interned air crews and confiscated the planes for the duration of the war. In May 1940, General Major Rappe, who was the deputy chief of the defense staff, issued the following orders regarding planes landing or crashing on Swedish territory. Any military troop without any further orders in the vicinity of the plane should remove the personnel from the plane and take them into custody. There they should be disarmed and all weapons and maps should be confiscated. The planes should be sealed and under no circumstances should the aircrew be allowed near the plane again. A report should be written and handed to both military and police authorities. The use of anti-aircraft fire against foreign airplanes would differ during the war. In 1941, after the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Germany requested that no attempts should be done to shoot down German planes. One should just shoot warning shots and make sure they leave the Swedish airspace, which the government agreed to. By 1942-43 this was changed to first shoot warning shots, then shoot effective fire to bring down all foreign aircrafts entering Swedish airspace. There is a tale told about an allied bomber entering Swedish airspace. And the Swedish military warning that if you don't turn back, we'll fire upon you. The Allied pilot simply replied, "Uh, we know. So the Swedish anti-aircraft guns opened fire. Whereas the pilot radioed back, you are shooting too low. To which the Swedish military replied, we know. Now this is just a tale told after the war, as Swedish anti-aircraft did shoot down both Allied and German planes. The number varies, but somewhere around 20 German planes and 5 Allied planes were shot down. However, the confirmation of this is difficult, as many planes entering Swedish airspace had been damaged before they were fired upon, so they might have crashed anyway. One would assume that this number could actually be lower than uh, 25 planes in total. The number of planes crashing in Sweden by year was in 1939, only three planes crashed in Sweden or landed. In 1940 it was 41, 19 German planes and four British. In 1941 there were 13 planes. In 1942 it was 11 planes. By 1943 it was 23 planes. And then the first American B-17 bombers landed in Sweden. By 1944, a staggering 164 planes made emergency landings or crashes in Sweden. And of those 164 planes, 120 were Americans. By 1945, 87 planes landed in Sweden and then the bulk was German planes, 54. So a total of 342 planes landed in Sweden. The number of airplanes pretty closely matched the intensity of the war in the vicinity of Sweden. At the beginning of the war, German airplanes were the most numerous. But after 1940, when the war moved away from the Swedish borders, those numbers quickly declined. In 1943-44, the Allied bombing offensive started and it reached a crescendo by 1944, which can be seen by the staggering 164 planes that made emergency landing in Sweden alone. By 1945, the Allies were winning, and most planes that came to Sweden were from Germany, either just faulty navigation or they tried to escape the war. So, what happened to the air crews and the planes? At the beginning of the war, German planes that could be flown would simply be returned to Germany, and the air crews would be sent home. An example of this is a Ju-52 plane that in 1940 made an emergency landing south of the Norwegian border on a field at Lure. 
That plane was dismantled, transported to an uh, aircraft wing F1 in Westeros, where it was repaired, and later that with two other Ju-52 were flown back to Germany on the 2nd of September 1940, carrying Swedish designations. Not really neutral there. This particular plane was then put back into Luftwaffe service, and it later crashed on the 2nd of March 1942 during the airlift to the Demyansk pocket on the Eastern Front. The air crews of this Ju-52 were held for a short while before they were repatriated to Germany, at the same time as a similar number of British flyers were also repatriated. Uh, mostly during the war, German pilots and crews were not interned at all. They were simply sent back. And at the beginning of the war, that was not really true for Allied personnel who had to stay in Sweden longer. This is probably because it was much harder to repatriate Allied personnel than it was to send German personnel home. But I think it is fair to say that German personnel was handled more lenient. How the air crews were housed differed in what countries they were from. For example, the US Air Force had a relatively big allowance, so they were housed in hotels. British air crews were also housed in hotels, but not the same one as the US Air Force. As it seems, the US and the British air crews did not get along. Polish interns, whose exile government had very little money, were housed in barracks or even barges. And they took on work to get some pocket money. I have not found anything specific about air crew that landed in 1939. But there were a 170 sailors interned for the duration of the war. They were housed in a pretty bad barge that were very cold in winter. Later they got better accommodations. They had very little money, but they were allowed to work and soon they got incorporated into the city of Maria Fred, where they were interned. Some of the officers were good, others like a German-friendly reserve captain, Laurel, who had a hobby to shoot in the direction of the rowing Polish sailors on his free time. However, his successor Gunnar von der Burg was, on the contrary, very well liked and respected. German air crews were interned in regiments, for a short while, if they weren't just simply sent back right away. Most of the camps were guarded at the beginning of the war, but later those guards were mostly removed, and very few restrictions were imposed. So military personnel were interned in Sweden, very much depended on how much money they had to spend, or where they came from. More wealthy countries could afford hotels and so were housed there. Poorer countries like Soviet Union or Polish military personnel lived in barracks. As I said, some Swedish officers were good, others were very German friendly and not good at all. In general, for most internees it was a relatively relaxed and free stay. They could work if they wanted to. Russian internees who lived in barracks were, could buy, build a kiosk and a sauna and move freely to the closest city. The same went for the Polish sailors by, uh, towards the end of the war. Even though in the beginning they, of the war they were very much more closely guarded than the US and British air crews. German aircraft were repaired and returned to Germany. Allied planes were also repaired but held until the end of the war. Another step away from neutrality. By 1943 the situation started to change. The war turned against Germany. Sweden was militarily stronger. But most importantly the great air bombing offensive against Germany had started. In 1943 eight American Air Force planes landed or crashed in Sweden. The first plane was a B-17 bomber called Georgia Rebel. Uh, 
who after a mission in Norway had been damaged by anti-aircraft fire, so it headed towards Sweden, landing at Oriang. Later that plane was transported to the uh, fighter wing F-7 in Sotenäs by boat for repairs. The crew of the Georgia Rebel was returned to England in November 1943. In 1944, after an agreement with the US, Sweden were allowed to use this and nine other B-17 planes in exchange for repatriating 300 US internees. Each plane was bought for the bargain price of one dollar per plane. Saab would convert seven of those planes into passenger planes and they were all named Felix after the US Air Attaché in Sweden at the time. Felix Hardison. In uh, 1944, a RAF Lancaster called ECLC were taking part in Operation Obviate on the 29th of October. It was a bombing attack against a German battleship Torpitz anchored in a Norwegian fjord. The plane was hit by anti aircraft fire and lost one engine before the bombing run. And after they had released their bomb, they got a second hit and another engine went out and they lost hydraulic pressure, which made the landing gear lower. Without fuel enough to reach England or Murmansk, it headed towards Sweden. Close to Porius, it crash landed on a mire with only the pilot sustaining a lighter injury, which was a quite impressive feat. Uh, They torched the plane and their maps and made a fire and waited for the Swedish soldiers, which would arrive shortly, taking them into custody. They were interrogated and all except the pilot, Kari, were transported to Stockholm. Kari had to spend a couple of days in hospital for his injury and then he was interned for three days before he was sent back to England. Uh, The plane, or what is left of it, can still be seen outside Porius. The 20th of June 1944 was a busy day in Sweden. No fewer than 21 bombers landed in Sweden, most at Bultofta airfield. Why is this? Well, Sweden had actually reached an agreement with the US to create five designated emergency fields for bombers that were involved in a bombing campaign against Germany. They did this in exchange for not burning up their planes. It seems that when they burned their planes, or rather when they managed to land on an airfield, they jumped out and burned their planes, blocking that airfield for days sometimes. Other operations were also instigated. One was Operation Sonny, which was the air operation to transport first some 2,000 Norwegian air crews to Great Britain. Later, a total of some 4,300 personnel were transported from Sweden to the UK during 15 months. As the war came closer to an end, Allied emergency landings decreased and more German planes came, more to escape than any pure emergency. Surprisingly enough, a lot of Fiesler Fi-156 storage planes landed in 1945. Some from faulty navigation, others simply to escape. An example is on the 8th of April 1945, a whole formation of 10 Fi-156 and one Junkers W-34 flying from Fischhausen entered Swedish airspace. A couple of Swedish J-20 fighters intercepted them, four Fi-156 turned away, but the rest landed at Åkersholm. The planes contained 12 men and one Russian woman. The men requested to be sent to Germany, the woman remained in Sweden. Two of those planes were later repaired and used by the Swedish Air Force. So in total 342 planes landed in Sweden during the war and most of those planes came from the US followed by Germany. How the different nations were treated were not neutral. German planes could leave or be repaired and then leave, which the Allied planes were not allowed to. 
However, secret flights between Sweden and Great Britain also took place during this time, so a step away from neutrality in the Allied favor. German pilots were usually quickly sent back home, whereas the Allied pilots had to wait longer. It is true that their repatriation of Allied pilots were much harder. They had to be flown from Sweden to the UK over German territory. And the planes they used for that were pretty small in the beginning of the war. When bigger planes were available, the repatriation were faster. And that one-to-one -one exchange for Allied and German air crews rather tipped over in the Allied's favor. Simply because it was many more Allied uh, pilots in Sweden than there were Germans. Allied planes landing in Sweden were repaired if possible and returned to their nation after the war. Some planes, most notably the B-17s, were traded and put into Swedish service. Something that was also done with some German aircraft. Internees were well treated, as far as my research have shown. With some exception, I think, the Polish submariners, they were housed in barges, which was not very good. All of them had pretty great freedom. They were usually allowed to move to the closest city without any, any check. And even if they were guarded in the beginning of the war, that more or less ended by, I don't know, 43, 44. They could even travel to Stockholm, but for that they had to get special permission. German internees in the later stages of the war were kept behind barbed wire. And one such camp was situated in Eksjö. But that is a story for another time. 